Hello, my name is Gareth Davies, and welcome, <laughs> a welcome to another edition of the Kiwi Astronomers. And I've got with me today the laughing professor, as he's as he's known uh, to his students at, at the University of Canterbury. It's Professor John Hernshaw. Um, John, we've we've had a, a long talk about John's um, illustrious career, and I can run this past you uh, briefly. He was actually born in Wellington in New Zealand. We won't hold that against him. Um, his mother was Australian. We might hold that against him. But the good news was his father was English. So he's got a big tick from me because there's a lot of English in my family. Hard to believe, but true. And as they, a tender age, he moved to Liverpool. Oh, and by the way, John, you feel free to correct me if I get this pricey wrong. But he moved to Liverpool. Uh, the so far, it's more or less correct. but. Actually, it was um, the Wirral Peninsula in UK. Okay, the Wirral, which is, the Wirral. Which is a safe distance from <laughs> Liverpool itself. There could be people from Liverpool listening, John, but that's all right. The Wirral, the Wirral. Um, in South Wales, is very similar. Most people, um, I'm from Merthyr, and most people like to say they come from Merthyr rather than places like, you know, Aberdeer or, or Swansea or Cardiff. So I understand how it is. Maybe Merth is something like the Wirral, who knows? I haven't been from my either. bedroom window. I could see North Wales oh. and um, the highest um, mountain in North in that part of North Wales was Moel Fama. Moel Vamai, if I'm being correct. I've pronounced it wrong. Sorry about that. Uh, there's a there's a wonderful Welsh poem where the, the children look out to Moel Vamai, and that is that is or Love the Interest Itself in Thoughtless Heaven by W.H. Auden. If I'm not grossly mistaken, you might want to Google that hey. later on. Children look to Moil Vamai. That's not quite the right line, but they would definitely look in. And Glamorgan hid a life grim as a tidal rock pool in its glove-shaped valleys. Anyway, moving on from the Wirral, uh, John went to Birkenhead School, which is, he had informed me is a, a, was a direct grand school, which is quite posh apparently and from there he went to Cambridge University and he studied at Trinity College uh, and who had Isaac Newton as one of its tutors and one of its students too John. Isaac Newton well, well he was um, a fellow of Trinity whether he was a student I'm not sure. Ooh, he was a fellow he was a fellow yes. of Trinity. And, then, and one of his greatest um, inventions while at Trinity, um, you know, he invented the cat door. The what? The cat door. The cat door, the cat flap, as we call it in Wales. The cat flap, yes. So <laughs> he had a cat and he wanted the cat to go in and out of his room at Trinity. So he cut a hole in the door and installed a flap. And then when the cat had a kitten, he cut another little hole next door to the big one, so the kitten could go in and out. I would have thought the Egyptians might have invented the cat flap. <laughs> yeah, but no, Isaac Newton did. Oh, amazing. He should, have, he should have patented it. And from <laughs> there, and from there, um, uh, John became a, a Commonwealth scholar, and he went to, um, Austra to the land of his mum, uh, to Australia, uh, to ANU, uh, where he did a PhD, and en route, on a boat, he met the lady um, uh, who was to be his future wife, Vicky. Um, uh, but she, they stopped off in the in New Zealand, and she stayed in New Zealand. Is that right? That's right. Yes. 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 She stayed in. Well, New I spent Zealand. two months in New Zealand um, on my way to Australia, and then John went off. Uh, to um, uh, ANU, and we'll run through this because we've got lots of interesting things to talk about beyond John's life story. Uh, he went to, uh, he got a Royal Society Fellowship and went to um, L'Observatoire de Paris, uh, where he worked um, uh, halfway between Paris and Versailles uh, as working for the observatory, doing observatory type things. Then he got a permanent job at the or a, a job at the universe at the observatory. He toured the US. He got a, a job offer um, after that at Harvard, and he he was at Harvard for eighteen months, 
um, after which he moved back to New Zealand um, to work at, as a lecturer at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch. And he moved his, himself up the, up, the, up the ladder there, ending up as, a, um, as the professor of astronomy in 1995. And he was a professor of astronomy at Canterbury University until 2014, when he became the emeritus professor. And we have a number of topics we wanted to discuss today. And the first one is relates to an organization that John Drummond and I have talked about on numerous occasions and which I've actually described as the, as the Space Police, the IAU. John, you hold, held, hold a quite a higher position in the IAU and perhaps you'd like to tell us about it. Well, that's the most recent one, but I had several other jobs. The most recent one was as vice president of the IAU, uh, serving on their executive committee. <clears throat> now, the IAU has an executive committee with 12 people, but six of those are vice presidents. And they're normally elected for six years to, to three-year terms. I just served for three years because I, I was filling in for someone else who was <laughs> who became president elect. Oh. So I I filled in for oh. um, that person. Oh. So this was 2018 until August this year. And and tell us why should people know about IAU? What's what's important about IAU? If you well, the you know, IAU is the International Astronomical Union. It's the um, kind of club for professional astronomers around the world. The about club. 12, the club. Well, it is a club. Yeah, um, about twelve thousand members. A large in club then. <laughs> Ninety countries, <laughs> and it was formed in twenty nineteen. And in fact, of all the scientific unions, of which there are several dozen, the IAU is the first one. So it's the oldest scientific union formed in July uh, 1919, just after the First World War. And um, it was it, the found, foundation was in Brussels, in Belgium. And uh, in 2019, I went to Brussels to celebrate the centenary which was good fun. So um, it started off as very much a kind of closed society with uh, elderly old gentlemen astronomers discussing esoteric subjects like uh, classification of stars and uh, choice of standard stars to um, do things. And many of the topics were rather boring, but <laughs> starting about 50 years ago, they, the IAU started evolving and they began to be interested in um, astronomy education. And in the last um, 20 or 30 years, it's become very socially active. And now the IAU has <coughs> involved itself with um, outreach and um, astronomy for development, so very strong in developing countries, using astronomy as a tool to promote um, the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and maths. So the IOU is now a very much an outward looking organization, and it's interacting with society. In fact, um, I was involved with forming a new working group of the IOU um, just this year, it's a working group for professional amateur relationships. And this working group is trying to um, get professionals to interact with the much larger body of amateur astronomers around the world who um, are doing often very good astronomy. And we are trying to promote research collaborations between amateurs and professionals. Can I, so, so can anybody become a member? Can I become a member? Sorry, Gareth, but first of all, you need to get a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> You're not meant to be a member of the IAU without a PhD, though there are a handful of people in that category who are actively involved with astronomy. 
who are IAU members. But it's got a little bit of a hurdle to join then, is that right? Well, it depends if you think a PhD is a hurdle. Good point. For some yeah. people, it's a piece of cake. Yeah, well, yeah <laughs> it is. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So we so, got that one um, clear. We got that one clear. Uh, you have to have a PhD to join, and then you can still be blackballed. The joining the IOU is free, and the IOU is funded by not the individual members, the astronomers, but it's funded by national members. So the New Zealand government pays, oh, I don't know, about twenty thousand dollars a year to be for New Zealand to be a member, a national member of the IAU. The United States pays far more. So small countries like New Zealand, depending on the number of professional astronomers, um, pay just a, a relatively small amount. But, but I was just checking if in the event that I do do a PhD, um, does that have to be a PhD in astronomy? Yes, of course, by right. Jove. And what about new Not only new that, physics? but you should be working in... Well, some people do PhDs in physics because the, the boundary between physics and astronomy is quite blurry. I was, thinking, I was thinking more of nuclear physics, but that's all right. I just wanted to check. And then on top of that, if I say, hey, it's Gareth, it's Dr. Gareth Davies here. Um, I'd, I'd like to join. Can they, will they just say, yes, no problem? Well, you have to be really recommended by your national committee for astronomy. In the case of New Zealand, this is um, the Professional Astronomers Group, which is uh, a group of, of the Royal Astronomical Society of New Zealand. And they will vet your application. I'm just writing this down. Professional Astronomers Group, yeah? Yes. All right. Excellent. And so we have a professional astronomers group in um, New Zealand. Do I know anybody on that group? In that group? Well, you you will know Nick Rattenbury at the University of Auckland, and he is the oh, chair yeah. oh, of yeah. PAG at present. So you should apply to Dr. Rattenbury at the University ah. of Auckland once you have your PhD. But actually, you need more than that. You need a, a job in astronomy. Oh, so so the IAU is for professional astronomers. <laughs> not just for anyone with a PhD. In so it's going to be, I, I've, got a, I've got my work cut out. Um, yes, a little bit. But we want, want... Who wants to be want, a member of a club that lets any old Tom, Dick or Francois in? Ah, but um, it's a very prestigious uh, society, the IAU. Well, obviously. So that's good. So that's the IAU. Um, I notice, um, having just quickly wikipedia it, that in fact, you have already booted out a number of states, suspended their membership. Uh, Absolutely, yes. It looks like because, Saudi, as I say, Arabia, Saudi Arabia. As I say, the IAU is funded by the national members. And in the case of a small country like New Zealand, it's still 20 odd thousand dollars a year. But for, um, really poor countries um, that don't have a lot of money for science, paying those uh, dues can be quite hard for developing countries. Well, I don't and want to say, you know, despite your statement of outreach, it looks as almost the entirety of Africa is not a member. That's correct. Nigeria is. Obviously, South Africa is a member. Uh, Egypt is, Morocco. Um, wow, you're doing well. You're right so far. Madagascar, most, Madagascar. Is Madagascar a member? Um, yeah. Possibly Namibia, but I'm not sure. Yeah, well, there you go. So that's the IAU. And I think and Botswana just applied for membership. Which one? Botswana. Oh, Botswana. <laughs> Good. Well, keep us posted on how their application goes. So, yes. so <laughs> I wonder how much you're going to charge Botswana. Yeah, well, thousand dollars. Ethiopia is doing very well in astronomy. They've got two one meter telescopes. I can Ethiopia. see they're, they're members, Ethiopia. I can see. Yes, it. well, there you are. Haile Selassie would be very happy. 
So um, uh, yes. So uh, so oh, I notice also that it it it's the IAU, but it's also the UAI. Uh, that's the Union Astronomique Internationale. Correct. And that's because in French they spell everything backwards. Uh, well, but they they did found it, right? Well, the IAU has two official languages, French and English. Um, I, much think to mean, the I think you mean English and French, don't you? Well, yes. Uh, <laughs> but when in 1919, um, France played a very big role in the founding of the Union. And in fact, the headquarters of the IAU are in Paris. So they do need to speak French from time to time. Just as well you speak, just as well you speak good French, John. Uh, I don't speak good French, but I, I, when I was working in Paris, I did give seminars in French, uh, in an appalling um, accent. But I think they un understood. They Merci asked. Some... Bon. Merci bon. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they asked some intelligent questions, so I must have said something they understood. Of course. Well, they gave you that job, right? So they must. They must have been impressed. So there you go, everyone. That's the IAU. Any anybody out there who's got a PhD um, uh, in astronomy, preferably, but nuclear physics will do at a pinch. Um, you go to your national um, professional astronomers group and uh, see whether you can join the IAU because obviously they do some good stuff. I do know that it was the IAU that chose the official name for the moon as the moon. Uh, and I, I don't know what the French thought because they were calling it La Lune at the time, uh, as they as they do. Um, but yes. unfortunately, um, the Anglophiles um, got the better on that vote, and they were the ones that gave the moon the official name, the moon. There you go, the IAU. Um, and in fact, John Drummond has a role in the IAU. He's not a member, obviously, because I know he hasn't got a PhD in, astro in astronomy, although he soon will. Um, well, the IAU, I should mention this, that the IAU has four officers around the world which are um, staffed by professional people, and one of those officers is the Office for Astronomy Outreach, which was founded oh, just a few years ago, and it's based in Tokyo, and the Office for Astronomy Outreach is very active in promoting stories about astronomy uh, in the media and to the public. And, um, oh, I've lost track of what I wanted John to say. Drummond, John Drummond is the new ah, yes. the office. The Office for Astronomy Outreach has a, in every national member country, a National Outreach Coordinator, or NOC, N-O-C. And John Drummond, in Gisborne is the National Outreach Coordinator of the IAU for the Office for Astronomy Outreach. Uh, but poor chap, he's only got a master's degree in astronomy, so he's obviously not a member. You don't have to be a member to be a NOC. Clearly, clearly. But of course, uh, John <laughs> is doing his PhD, yes. so he might, Soon he might yet rise, become. He'll rise to the top table. Yes, that, so he did tell me that's one of the reasons he's going so hard to get his PhD so that he can be up there, you know. Yeah, and one day he might he be. Want to just be a basic the IAU. Knock. He's, he's mm -hmm. tired of just being knocked about, so to speak. Yes. Uh, so he wants to be to to move up, and uh, you can understand. Really good. There you yes. go. So, everybody, now you know IAU is the place to go. Oh, hey, that rhymed. All right. So on to showing, you know, John being a, a professional astronomer, um, his his expertise is in um, uh, spectroscopy. Am I right, John? Well, um, one of your expertise is... Stellar spectroscopy was um, the topic I was researching for my PhD in Australia. And that was in the... Uh, 1960s and early 70s and I've been doing stellar spectroscopy ever since until I retired but since retiring from the University of Canterbury I um, can't really call myself a spectroscopist anymore, anymore because yeah. that's sad I, 
That's sad. Well, it, no, it's not because um, uh, I enjoyed doing spectroscopy, but I, in retirement, I there are so many other interesting things to do that I've decided not to stay re research active. Do you Old spectroscopists that? don't don't die; they simply go on to do something else. Yes, maybe. Yeah. Excellent. Anyway, so. You want to know what's spectroscopy for the, lay, for the lay person out there, those of us who those of us who can't coming back to, to Isaac IAU, Newton. You would like to know coming back to is. Isaac Newton, you know that he passed a beam of sunlight uh, through a prism and found it was a spectrum uh, was produced. In other words, the prism disperses the light, and he showed that white light emitted by the sun really is a mixture of colors, or as we say today, a mixture of wavelengths, different wavelengths of light. And the blue light or the violet light has a fairly short wavelength. The red light, a longer one, about twice as much as the blue. And you could separate these different colors of light. And that is spectroscopy. And if you can disperse the light, which means split it up into its component colors, and then record the spectrum, you can find all sorts of interesting things about the sun and the stars or the body that's emitting light. So my interest for my thesis was to record the spectra of stars of similar type to, that of, to the sun, uh, what we call G-type stars. The sun is a G-type star. <coughs> so I was <coughs> recording the spectra of G stars to measure their chemical composition. And we do that because the different elements and the outer layers of a star absorb the light at discrete wavelengths. And um, so light is uh, partially missing at certain very precisely defined wavelengths characteristic of each element. Now the element that produces the most absorptions in the solar type stars is iron. So there are actually tens of thousands of these so-called absorption lines in the spectrum of the sun and solar type stars. Other elements have uh, a fewer lines, uh, absorption lines than that. Uh, some of the strongest lines are those of calcium and sodium. And the sodium D lines, as they're called, in the orange part of the spectrum uh, are also very strong. Anyway, by measuring the absorption line strength, how much these elements uh, have removed of light at these discrete wavelengths, we can get the composition of stars, find out how much of each element there is, so in my thesis, I was measuring the chemical composition of stars like the sun. The stars I selected to observe were stars suspected of being um, very old, generally older than the sun. Now we know that when stars evolve, when they age, they get a little bit brighter and a little bit, um, generally a little bit cooler as well. So. Uh, they emit more red light as they get cooler and they, and they get a bit brighter. So if we can measure the evolution of a star based on its, how much brighter it is, we can estimate its age. And I was um, selected about two dozen stars, which were, um, well, the sun is four and a half billion years old since it was formed. The stars I was looking at were somewhat older than that, sort of six, seven, eight uh, billion years old, perhaps in the few extreme cases, 10 billion. So these are called old disk stars, so John, not as old as, as the about, halos. What about emission lines? Ah, now, uh, just about all stars have these absorption lines. A few stars also have emission lines, and whether um, an element's lines appear in emission or absorption depends on the um, structure of the atmosphere. And the general rule is that if 
stars are hotter going inwards, you will have an, a, an absorption line. But if you have uh, temperature increasing outwards, that will give rise to an emission line. And there are some stars with rather hot outer layers, circumstellar envelopes, and um, which have emission lines. Well, the sun actually has uh, a very weak um, layer of very hot gas called the corona, and uh, another layer of hot gas uh, below that called the chromosphere. And the chromosphere and corona both give rise to emission lines, but those lines are very weak and fairly hard to observe, except during a solar eclipse. So John, if I might ask us, uh, uh, yes, actually I saw some, some lines, promontories, I think, on the uh, Antarctic solar eclipse. Okay, but there are stars with very extensive uh, circumstellar envelopes, and for example, fast rotating stars called BE stars. B stars are very hot, and the small e refers to emission. These stars have very extensive circumstellar envelopes. And then you've got stars, um, eruptive stars like Novi, uh, which explode and give a huge layer of hot gas given off. They also have emission lines. <coughs> so to get absorption lines, you need a generally a stable atmosphere with temperature increasing inwards. And that atmosphere is called the photosphere. So when we observe the spectrum of a star, normally we observe a photosphere with absorption lines. And those are the ones moderately easy to analyze to get chemical composition. So, so Emission so, lines are, um, are somewhat rare, just a very small fraction of the stars have observable emission lines. Okay, so measuring the distance of stars is one of the hardest things to do in astronomy. Um, and that's really um, been the case until very recently where um, satellites like Gaia and before Gaia, Hipparchos, were measuring um, distances by the parallax method from space. But from the surface of the Earth, um, measuring distance is extremely hard. But there are several ways of doing it, at least um, approximately. The oldest method is to measure the parallax based on the motion of the Earth around the sun. And the nearby stars show very tiny displacements uh, with a period of one year based on the Earth's orbit around the sun. And that uh, wasn't solved until the middle of the 19th century um, by various astronomers. Uh, um, Henderson at the Cape was the first, but not the first to publish. So um, parallax uh, only applies for the very nearby stars. And if you measure the angular shift of a star, you can just using uh, a trigonometry find the distance to up that. Just to, up to 50 light years away, I read. Yes, that would be about right. So that's extremely nearby on the scale of things, remembering that the our Milky Way galaxy has a diameter of about 100,000 light years. So 50 light years is just the immediate solar neighborhood. But stars like Alpha Centauri, the nearest to the sun, um, have a measurable parallax, which Henderson was able to uh, determine. So, um, Parallax is one method, but spectroscopy can also be used to determine the distance of a star. And um, the assumption, first of all, was that all stars are like the sun and they give out the same amount of light as the sun. And clearly, the further away a star is, the fainter it appears from Earth. But um, that should be uh, the basis of a photometric distance method, provided all stars really do put out the same amount of light per second, what we call the same luminosity. We now know that um, that is not the case, and some stars are far more luminous than is the sun. And therefore, the photometric method um, 
can become incredibly unreliable. So we now know there are giant stars, which are um, perhaps a hundred times more luminous than the sun, and supergiant stars, which are thousands of times more luminous than the sun, and therefore can be seen at great distances. Now, the way that we can use spectroscopy is to use spectroscopy to determine what kind of star we are looking at and distinguish the small stars like the sun, which is a dwarf star, from the giants, which are very large but low density stars, and the supergiants, which are even <coughs> larger and lower density. So spectroscopy can estimate the luminosity of a star. And then we know how star, bright a star appears and how luminous it really is, then we can get a distance. So I think the analogy, if you look at looking at a candle from 10 meters, it will look fairly faint, but a searchlight from 10 kilometers might look the same brightness to you as a candle from 10 meters. So how can you measure the distance of a candle? Well, you've got to know, is it a searchlight or a candle? Spectroscopy <laughs> will tell you which. So John, just sort of in a, in a nutshell for those of us out here who don't have master's degrees in astronomy. Um, basically, uh, parallax was, was great, um, but uh, only for stars a certain distance away, up to 50 light years. But then after that, um, the way we're able to tell how far away stars are is to use um, spectroscopy, yeah? Is that- is Yes, that to, and this enabled, um, stars star distances to be measured for um tens or even hundreds of light years even thousands of light years so much greater distances and many many more stars but with error bars of perhaps uh, 10 20 or even 50 percent in the distance but statistically you could get a lot of information from these so-called spectroscopic parallaxes and then we put so, up a, we put up a few satellites like Hipparchus, and that used parallax from out the space. And that, that I read somewhere that went up to four hundred light years, but it still can't get beyond that. And we're still relying basically on spectroscopy. Yeah, so Hipparchus was a European satellite in the nineteen nineties, and it measured over a hundred thousand stars. And to get the parallaxes, you had to measure the position of stars and the change in position with a precision of about a milli arc second. That's an incredibly small angle, a thousandth of an arc second. Mm. An arc second is uh, a 3,600 um, uh, part of a degree. Oh. So you can see we're talking about millionths, millionths of a degree wow. in the precision. Wow. And wow. Gaia, the satellite which is still uh, observing now, does um, in the best cases um, micro arc second precision. Wow, that is so amazing. A million of an arc second, so quite crazy. And that way you can get um, distances to billions of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. Wow, wow, but still for the other galaxies, we're still using spectroscopy. Well, for other galaxies, um, getting. Um, Stellar spectra is not that easy for individual stars, with the exception of the Magellanic clouds, which are the two small satellite galaxies. And um, Andromeda, we, didn't, we did it for Andromeda, didn't we? For the variable stars there. Eh? Well, there is another way of getting distance, and that's going back to Henrietta Leavitt, and she measured, established this period luminosity law yeah. for pulsating stars. And the stars with the longer periods of pulsation, especially the Cepheid variables, have higher luminosities. And she showed that. So these are stars uh, that pulsate in and out and their brightness changes, but the mean luminosity over a cycle is uh, very tightly correlated with the period of pulsation, oh, yes. ranging from a few days to, um, maybe 40, 50 days in the longest cases. And this period luminosity law was established for nearby pulsating stars, nearby to the sun, 
and then it can be applied to much further away ones, such as in the Andromeda galaxy or in the Magellanic clouds, and assuming the same law applies in these distant parts of the universe, you can measure their distance. So we now know, for example, that the Andromeda is about 2 million light years away and the Magellanic clouds, oh, I've forgotten, 180,000. So now everybody, now you know, thanks, John. That's, that cleared that up. Thank you. A lot of people say, how do we know? We can't drive this. How do we know how far it is? And you've given a very detailed answer as to how we know. So changing- Yes, yeah, so stellar distance is a fascinating topic because- And, and talking about so fascinating different. topics and changing direction, uh, the next topic I wanted to talk to you about was your trip to, wait for it, everyone, North Korea. Well, that was a fascinating experience. <laughs> and, um, I suppose traveling to um, inaccessible, far off places has been a bit of a hobby for me. And um, I certainly enjoy going to places where um, the normal creature comforts uh, are not available. Oh, you, you must and... go to Mercer Tidville sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> So um, I've done a lot of traveling in developing countries, uh, working for the International Astronomical Union. <clears throat> but the IAU has a big conference every three years. In 2012, this general assembly was in Beijing. And so I spent two weeks in Beijing in um, August 2012. And I thought, well, Beijing is only a few hundred kilometers from Pyongyang, which is the capital city of North Korea. Why don't I go to um, Pyongyang and talk to astronomers there? Well, no um, Western astronomer had ever been to North Korea before. In fact, no astronomer uh, had been to North Korea except for a few Chinese um, in, the, in the 20th century. So uh, it was very unusual for astronomers to want to go to North Korea. But, I th but there is an organization called the um, North Korea New Zealand Friendship Society. And they have um, people both in Pyongyang and in New Zealand who try and uh, maintain friendly relationships. So I wrote to the secretary in Wellington can you arrange a visit for me to go to Pyongyang? And the uh, man in Wellington uh, contacted the opposite number in Pyongyang and they arranged a visit for me. Wow. So the people in Pyongyang said, well, we do have an observatory here, um, no telescopes, but at least some people in the Pyongyang Astronomical Observatory. Some no, more tele no telescopes. Well, they, they do theoretical work, I suppose. Hmm. Anyway, um, they said, please do come and give us some seminars in Pyongyang. And, but what we really want is some uh, textbooks and, and um, conference uh, proceedings. So books uh, are not okay. generally available in North Korea. So they're completely cut off from the world. So I said I'd try and bring a few. So what I did is I um, emailed a few dozen of my friends at the conference in Beijing and said, when you come to China, bring some uh, books with you that you no longer want, and I'll take them with me to Pyongyang because that's what they desperately want. Well, I, I ended up with um, about 100 kilograms of books and I was going to go to Pyongyang by train from Beijing, which I did. Then I found out that um, there's a weight limit on the train. I can't imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> and probably the, just as well, I, I found that out. So I didn't know what to do. I had 109 books weighing 100 kilos packed into about 12 cardboard boxes in my hotel in Beijing. How do I get them to um, Pyongyang? Well, I contacted my 
um, person in the Friendship Society in Pyongyang. And he says, well, I'll get Air Koryo, which is the North Korean airline, to fly them in. Flying shop, with flying shop with camels. <laughs> yes. So uh, I took all the boxes to um, Beijing airport and saw the Air Koryo agent there. And indeed, they flew uh, 100 kilograms of oh, astronomy amazing. textbooks for free. And they arrived um, uh, the same day that I caught the train. The train journey, by the way, takes to, it was meant to take 24 hours, but my train took 26, and it was late. That's not bad. Riding the red rooster, as they say. Really? I haven't heard that term. Yeah, that, that's that, that um, Eric Newby, is it? Or one of those. That's what oh. he called it. He, he took a train journey through China. I actually did. I went... I was working in a place called San Mesh in Hebei province, and I, I got on one of those trains. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the guys were eating nuts all the way and throwing them on the floor. And every hour or so, a dude would come up with a, with a brush and brush all these nut, nut casings <laughs> away. <laughs> my experience. So, anyway, I, six um, hours, not bad. Two hours later. I had a week in um, Pyongyang. Yeah. And. Um, I had two people uh, from the ministry um, assigned to me to look after me. And they were very nice people, spoke very good English, young people. So they were my minders and they stay in the same hotel and um, they arranged a fantastic time for me. So in a week I did, I think 18 cultural visits and I gave three seminars at um, Kim Il-sung University, which is the main university in Pyongyang. The seminars were all two hours each, and it's very impressive, but they uh, were very fluent in English. So even though they, I had translations into Korean, they told me afterwards that the translations were totally unnecessary, and they could understand <coughs> my English perfectly well. And the facilities were very modern at Kim Il-sung University, very good lecture theatre and very good um, projection device. And they had a, a huge screen with rear illumination. So the um, projector is behind the screen, a bit unusual. And um, I guess I was treated like royalty. I had a limousine and a chauffeur assigned to me for the week. And we toured around and went to all sorts of interesting places. The most extraordinary place um, was um, this festival they have every year in September called Ari, Ari Ren. And it's in an outdoor um, sports stadium. And they, it's sort of coordinated gymnastics and dance festival with 100,000 um, people performing, did, not all at once, but thousands at any time. Did they ask you to go out and perform anything cultural when you were there? No, but I did go to uh, a couple of secondary school, a primary school and a secondary school, where they did performances, the school students did performances for me. And that was also amazing. There was, but there was no request um, for you to sort of do, you know, a uh, uh, a, a haka or sing a song or anything? No, but I went to um, the New Zealand Friendship School, which is a school supported oh, wow. by the, um, I suppose, by the Friendship Society. And they um, they sang Pokari Kariana for me. I knew, you'd, I knew you'd give me a nice segue in because when I rode the Red Rooster to San Mercia with a couple of other Kiwis, um, we were we were um, in our hotel room one night playing cards, as one does, and knock on the door. We were whisked away to an indoor sports arena, and the three of us went. Were, were, the television cameras were on us, and we were put in the middle of this arena. And we they asked us to perform something, uh, a, a New Zealand song, and so we all sang for Kari Kariana. There you go. I, I I think I was the only one who knew the words. The other dudes just hummed. <laughs> they were from Lincoln, actually. Lincoln University. Very good. Down your way. They were good hammers, though. They were very good hammers, and I sang. 
So they probably think that most New Zealanders speak like I do. But so anyway, so that was your so that was your time there. You you, what did you think about it? Were they were they were they you know hungry for knowledge? Were they were they advanced in any particular thinking? Were they had they gone down the wrong wrong track? Did well, you did you maintain the, did you maintain the link? Um, they're very good on um, computers and IT, so they certainly concentrate on that. I felt the astronomy was not at the Pyongyang Observatory, it was not very well developed. And I wasn't allowed to visit the observatory as I was told it was under reconstruction. So the <clears throat> Pyongyang Astronomical Observatory astronomers came to the university and I met them there. And um, what did I think of the country? Well, Obviously, they um, are, have incredibly severe restrictions, and only very few people have access to email or the internet. So they really have no understanding of the outside world, which is a bit sad. But the North Koreans are incredibly friendly people and very easy to talk to. And um, although we hear a lot in the West about um, food shortages, which they admitted certainly have existed. I didn't notice any shortage of food when I was there. And in fact, I invited um, seven of my, six or seven of the North Koreans to a restaurant, the best restaurant in Pyongyang. And I was host for a really amazing dinner with many, many courses and lots and lots of food for these people. And it was probably the best meal they've ever had in their lives. But for me, it was just normal sort of Western prices. I paid for everything in euros. I took euros with me. And I think um, a slap up dinner of many courses for seven people cost about 200 Euro euros. So it wasn't that expensive. What, 200 euros in total? In total, yes. Wow. Oh, wow. So that was, um, an amazing experience, and they really they got, enjoyed it. I hear they got very dark skies there, though. Absolutely. So you can look at the um, light pollution map of the whole globe, and you see all this light streaming up from the developed countries, including South Korea and China, with huge light pollution. But there are almost no street lights in North Korea, so the skies are incredibly dark. They are a model. They are a model. Yes. But dark sky. <laughs> so it's astronomers paradise with no light pollution, dark skies. What a great place to be. Did you keep contact with them after that? Well, um, the person in the um, North Korea and New Zealand Friendship Society in Pyongyang actually came to New Zealand um, at the end of 2012 for a visit. So I saw him again here. And the head of the um, computational physics department at Kim Il sung University was lucky enough to have sabbatical in Beijing um, a few years later. And he was therefore able to open a, an email account from China. And we occasionally ex have exchanged emails um, during his time in China. He must have been several times. So I've been able to maintain contact um, through him, yes. So you still maintain a contact with, 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 with those? Um... Just occasionally, yes. Uh, yeah. Well, there you go. So one of the very few astronomers to go to, to, to North Korea. Well, I was told I was the only um, non-Chinese astronomer ever to visit North Korea. Wow. And there are very few uh, scientists at all who ever get there. Wow. So um, you can see that giving the seminars on astronomy at the university was probably quite a special um, experience for them as well as for me, because not something they do every day. Well, thanks, John.
I think we've come to the end of our time here now, but that's been really amazing. I mean, firstly, you are, you are, um, your story coming from Wellington, going around the world, going to Harvard, ending up in 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 Canterbury. I mean, you could have had, you could have won lotto and ended up in Auckland, but Canterbury is okay. Um, and then, you know, the the things that you've done, the places you've been, and I know that that North Korea is just one of the many places that you've been to and let's hope we get a chance uh in our in our future talks to talk about some of the other interesting places that that, that you've been to uh and again for telling everybody about um spectroscopy it's always something that i that i find fascinating and obviously the role that is played in, in stellar distances which people simply you know, always want to know well how do you know that so thank you and of course explaining to us about the all-powerful IAU, and the fact that most of us poor losers are never going to be members. So that's rather sad, dashed hopes, um, or who knows, maybe I'll try harder, maybe I'll switch from my plans to be, do a PhD in astrophysics. Why not? Why not? Who knows? But there you go. Thank you very much for your time. You're most welcome. So let's talk again sometime soon. Very soon, very soon. So there you go, everyone. Thanks for listening to us. And I'm going to play you out now uh, with, um, as you know, my favourite singer and sure in the future to become John's favourite singer as well. So take good care. See you all. Bye. Bye. Take me to Callisto so I can see the stars. I want to view the Milky Way from a terraform base on Mars. From a terraform base on Mars. From a terraform base on Mars.